This is Jadecast, your gateway to traditional martial arts and Chinese culture. Brought to you by your host, Shuffle Jonathan Bluestein. Hello everyone! I am very excited to present to you our first guest on JadeCast, Shifu Julian Dale, a veteran martial arts teacher and a friend. Shifu Dale brings with him to this interview no less than 36 accumulated years of martial arts experience. He runs a very successful martial arts school near London where he teaches his signature Eagle Claw system, but also Tai Zi Chuan, also known as Tai Chi, Qi Gong, and Lion Dancing. Today, Shifu Dale and I are going to have a blast telling you all about his unique Eagle Claw system, while also discussing fascinating aspects of Chinese traditional culture. We are going to touch upon history, philosophy, and also some methods of application. Stick around as this is going to get interesting. Julian, welcome to the podcast. Many thanks, Jonathan. It's good to be here with you. So Julian and I have been uh, corresponding for many years and I'm very happy to have him as my first guest on the podcast. He's a very serious uh, and seasoned practitioner of Chinese traditional arts. And uh, I gotta say, Julian, as a young boy, did you ever think you're gonna graduate to be a master of something called Eagle Claw? Uh, first of all, Jonathan, I don't consider myself to have mastered anything other than just being a perpetual student. Um, uh, when I was a young boy, did I ever think I'd be doing this? Absolutely not. Um, it's been a long journey of 36 years now, uh, and I'm, I'm still on the path, and I'm still just trying to improve a bit day by day and uh, um, aspire to follow in the footsteps of such great masters and such a great system that I train in. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really nowhere near where I would like to be. I always look upwards. I mean, you, you have a distinct advantage because... Uh, you have the fierceness of an eagle to you and you're also bold. So you're like a bold eagle. Not a lot of people are oh. like the animal of their own Kung Fu style, right? Yeah, thanks so much for pointing out the hair loss. <laughs> I think that's from, that's from many years of pulling my own hair out in frustration. <clears throat> so, yeah. Well, you know, it's like um, in, the, in the Southern Mantis system, there are quite a lot of teachers that end up... Uh, kind of looking like mantises over the years to get this uh, skinny and tendony sort of musculature, right, from the art? Yeah, well, that's something that I've certainly noticed um, uh, in practitioners uh, who specialize in seizing and grabbing um, skills. Uh, I have uh, uh, a very good friend who passed away uh, earlier this year from the Czech Republic in Prague. His name was... Uh, uh, Yiri Hushek, and he was a, a practitioner of uh, Fuzhou, long, long term, and his hands really looked like tiger claws, the joints and the fingers, uh, and I noticed that uh, in our family village, also over time, the hands certainly do change shape um, through the strengthening and conditioning, the, the tendon and exercises, um, and seasoned practitioners, you'll <clears throat> certainly notice that the, the whole body changes within uh, traditional Chinese martial arts anyway. But yeah, um, photos, you can see it certainly in photos where, where you see the hands and things like that. So you just mentioned the conditioning of hands in traditional Chinese martial arts. And I think it is a, a controversial topic nowadays. Uh, I'll, I'll give my take on this. So but many people... Uh, claim that you know this is just a waste of time because you're never going to condition your fingers to the point that you can use them like claws in the fight and you know people talk about uh, ripping skin and, and things like that 
and it would seem to me that certain things are certainly possible, but it's just that the amount of time and effort that such things takes take no, not to mention the types of specialized medicine that you have to apply are just things which are not accessible to most people nowadays and therefore we don't have a lot of believers so coming from a system eagle claw and we're going to talk about a lot about your system as we move along here um what is your take about the possibilities in conditioning one's hands and fingers for use in combat I think there are two approaches. There's an internal and an external approach with regard to conditioning. You see a lot of people, they're doing things like 90-day uh, <clears throat> iron palm training. This, I think, is, is crazy. Uh, within you know, 90 days, they're, they're shoving their fingers into steel ball bearings and rocks and things like that. Um, I, I don't think that that's very healthy. This type of uh, training is slow and steady over a long period of time. Uh, you do need the right medicines, you need the right internal training in terms of the breath work, the visualization, um, the, the, the qigong, whether people believe it or not, is fine, no problem. Um, but yes, you can develop some significantly interesting uh, and what some people would say miraculous skills or abilities but this isn't like a short-term thing this is long term uh, as you know yourself uh, as you internalize your training you go more to the tendons and the ligaments away from the muscle um, the right kind of conditioning on the the, the the palms and the bones the skin should be quite nice and soft on the outside but on the inside the bones densify over a period of time so bones are, are porous they're like sponge but obviously hard sponge but they have small holes over a period of time with the right training those holes calcify so the bone becomes harder and denser there's that aspect to it over time you learn how to relax more and uh, only emit power or force at the very last split second but it's a kinetic chain of, of energy that's linked together and expressed right at that very last moment so you get the whole body power as they talk about in Chinese Kung Fu that the whole body power links together and can be emitted in a very small or specific point when striking or hitting. This is the same in eagle claw in, in, in the, the fingers. Um, you see a lot of different shapes of, of grabbing um, and you can tell whether the person's using the pad of their fingers or the tips of the fingers and how you train the ligaments through the hands to put the power right in the tips and what, what you're doing with, with the grabbing and seizing at the time. Um, now that you're yeah. making those, those finger shapes, <laughs> uh, it's sort of reminiscent of perhaps videos I've seen of Glenn Gould, the famous pianist, talking about the specialized technique of <coughs> percussion uh well you could in his case you could call it almost percussion on the piano um that it, techniques that he had studied since he was a little boy to attain that very specific unique sound that he had come to develop and it's i think it's similar in the expression of force that's very minute very precise and it, it takes decades to get that yeah, I, none of these, everybody wants to be a 10 minute master. Hey, me too. You know, I want to achieve skill in as soon as I can try uh, learn it. But just because you've learned it doesn't mean to say you know it. You have to refine it over a long period of time. And this is where the, the, the skill of Chinese Kung Fu is in the right teaching with a system, not a style, because style is the, 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 the external cloth, the, the material. But the system has layers and specific training methods and skills. And if, you, if you're patient and if you've got a good teacher, you can, you know, you can achieve a lot with hard work as, as well. Uh, most people are very sort of Kung Fu tourists. They're, they're, they come and do a couple of lessons a week or a little bit here, a little bit there, not realizing that what you learn in the lesson is the homework that you do outside of the school that is the development. 
the, the teaching is the teaching it's the development that takes place in your own time through daily repetitive um individual practice like uh you know doing the the show the, the 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 seizing hand one technique a thousand times practice it a thousand times refine it speed it up go faster until your body structure loses its cohesion then slow down a little bit work on the detail the connection and then speed up again because you see a lot of people as i'm sure you'll appreciate in, in seeing a lot of people's speed exceeds their skill hmm. so you, yeah. can, can you repeat that you, you just said a very interesting <laughs> sentence a lot of people's speed exceeds their skill so well, i i think i know what you mean but for listeners please elaborate on that a lot of people chase speed too soon so they want to be fast quite they just want to go fast when really what they need to do is slow down work on structure detail body mechanics smooth so there's that old saying uh smooth is slow or, or is it slow is smooth and smooth is fast slow is smooth smooth is fast the smoother that your movement gets with refined body mechanics the faster you can go with less resistance and then everything flows smoothly but you can you can actually attain <laughs> uh, a decent measure of speed without being so-called prepared for it and then what happens um well you have explosive speed don't you is that what you're referring to just go from zero to a hundred yes uh, what i seem to to notice that people who develop uh, a measure of speed that's ahead of the rest of their bodies tend to injure their ligaments and joints. Yeah, they're going too fast for their body skill. Mm -hmm. So their connective tissue, the fascia, the layers, the tendons haven't been trained and developed over a period of time to strengthen the collagen within them. Mm -hmm. And also you'll see that uh, in a lot of the modern Wushu, which is very athletic, tremendously skillful. Wushu athletes have a, a, a time limit to their body, and then they start getting joint problems, knee problems, elbow problems. Yeah, just, the old I'm time sorry, to, sorry to pause you for just a moment. Some of our listeners might not know the difference between traditional Chinese martial arts and what we call Wushu. Uh, wushu yeah. literally means martial arts in Chinese. Uh, it's martial arts. However, when we say wushu, when, when Julian speaks of wushu here, he means modern wushu. So sports-oriented traditional Chinese martial arts, uh, not so traditional anymore actually, um, of which there are several types, but he was talking specifically about those types in which you go and you compete with um, beautiful performances for showmanship, for points, which is quite different for, uh, for the goal of self, uh, as compared to the goal of self development, self cultivation, self defense that we find in the traditional Chinese martial arts. Sorry for cutting you off, Julian. Please continue. No problem. So, when we talk about traditional wushu, we, talk, we refer to it as chuan uh, tong wushu, traditional. Chuan tong wushu is traditional martial arts. Um, the uh, modern competition routines, and they train so hard. They're elite athlete level, and they're amazing. I have the utmost respect for them. They train as elite athletes, and they compete at you know world level. Um, very pleasing to the eye in terms of aesthetics. But that is what I would consider a style, not a kung fu system or a martial arts system that has layers upon layers upon layers. Okay, so I, I want to get into the that difference that you brought up the second time already between the system and the style. But beforehand, just going back a little bit, uh, talking about the conditioning of the hands. So our problem <coughs> here as teachers uh, is as follows. It's much more financially lucrative to sell someone a 90-day iron palm seminar, or who, not even a 90-day, you know, people go about and, and advertise they're going to have a three-day iron palm seminar. In three days, you're going to have an iron palm, you're going to have iron claws, etc., etc. And it's much more difficult when a student comes into school and uh, on his third class, he asks, oh, uh, Truffle, on, like, how, how long is it going to take me to have those iron claws? Like, is it going to be, what, like, uh, two months, six months? And then you're like, ah, 
how am I going to tell him it's going to take 10 years, mm, maybe 20 years, depends on the effort. So we have a problem here, right? Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> three years of consistent daily basic training will give you a good, good, good basic skill. Um, 10 years, yeah. But most people don't want to wait 10 years because the way society is now, everything is in an instant. It's pot noodle kung fu, you know, you just make it hot water, stir it around and eat it. But uh, nutritional value, zero. Taste value, blah, no good. So, uh, yeah, I mean, good. You look at um, the comparison with an orchestral level musician. You know, there's studies done on music. 10,000 hours of practice. 10,000 hours of practice. And that's everyday practice. It's not like here and there. It's like two, three hours every day, 10,000 hours to get good. So if you want to get good at your Kung Fu, 10,000 hours, daily practice, you know, three years, basic. But that's training really solid scales of your Kung Fu, the scales in music, and then learning how to make sentences. And then you can learn how to have a conversation between two people in terms of their skill. I give something, it's a question, fun you have a, an answer. So then I have to answer your question. Fun's out. So uh, uh, the exchange between two people is like a conversation. It's questions and answers. Just depends whose vocabulary is the best. Mm. So ba basically you're comparing a seasoned martial artist to a good orator. Um, in, in terms of their skill, because you, you talk with your hands, don't you? Hmm. Yeah. Well, um, I just want to give a little bit of context to listeners because uh, Julian just mentioned uh, the 10,000 hours uh, before we get into the difference between uh, style and the system and maybe then we can um, go to the roots of uh, Julian's training in Eagle Claw and uh, his journey for the system, its history, etc, etc. And even uh, if we remember, hopefully, we can touch upon uh, some stuff related to Bagua Zhang that you mentioned to me recently. Uh, with respect mm -hmm. to connection to Eagle Claw, which I think is going to interest a lot of people. So 10,000 hours, uh, a lot of folks know this thing from a book by uh, best-selling author Malcolm Gladwell, wrote a book called The Tipping Point. In this book, he was talking about this research, which is actually the original. Uh, the, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to remember the exact, uh, very accurate details. I'd read that book and that piece of research many years ago. But it roughly goes like this. They had uh, conducted research in a music school and they took up students uh, that started from scratch, from nothing. They had no musical experience. They were all of the same age groups. And they measured exactly how many hours of training they had gotten through their time in the school, both in class and outside of class. Even training, they did alone by themselves in their room. And they followed up on these musicians and they tried to see if there would be a correlation between the number of hours they had put into the practice and the level of expertise and skill and ability and also uh, their placement in their uh, musical careers if they chose to continue with music later on in their life. So uh, it was very interesting what happened. Um, People who had roughly, I think it was uh, three to 4,000 hours. So 3,000 to 4,000 hours in total uh, over uh, a long period of time and maybe um, over 10 years were, were good. They had gotten much better than, than people with no musical experience or those who didn't train hard, but they were maybe, you know, at the, um, at the, at a local level, you could say like, okay, they're a good musician compared to the size of their town or their standout in, in their city, just stand out. Uh, musicians that put in as much as uh, 5,000 to 7,000 hours uh, could maybe teach the music at a higher level or maybe could be on the national level in terms of where their career went or their level of skill or the appreciation others had for them in, in their expertise with certain instrument or several instrument. But it was observed finally that those people who had gotten in 
at least, that's some of the much more, 10,000 hours of training. Everybody that, almost everybody that had gotten 10,000 hours of training, if they persisted, had gotten to be on what could be uh, deemed an international level. International level meaning that on the international scene, relatively few people, maybe a few hundred or a few thousand people were at the same level because all over the world, very few people had put in 10,000 hours into their musical skills. And later on with uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book, uh, The Tipping Point and, and other authors talking about this and researchers and this research was expanded by other people. Um, they all realized that ten, the 10,000 hour rule that you need 10,000 hours to uh, so-called master um, a subject matter uh, was also true for, for a lot of other things and many people take it to be true for the martial arts as well. Um, so that is the context. So that's why a lot of people nowadays, and, and Julian, we mentioned 10,000 hours, uh, because once you, you've nailed down, you really had 10,000 real hours of training, you're going to have a very high level of skill in your respective art if, if your teacher was good and if your training was sincere and if you really researched what, what you were doing. Because you can't spend 10,000 hours just going through the motions and not really get, getting anything out of it. So it has to be good training with a good teacher. In martial arts, often you need a good lineage. But if all of these things, after 10,000 hours, yeah, you're going to have a high level of skill. So, uh, Julian, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, there was some scientific research done on what's actually happening with regard to the neuromuscular programming at that level. Um, <clears throat> insofar as the uh, nerve uh, electrical impulses that are taking place between the brain and, say, the fingers or what have you, or any part of the body, travels down uh, the nerves, which over a period of time, the electrical impulses or, the, or the, the chemical release, which is what nerve impulses are, they're, they're chemical reactions. When you rifle out a barrel, you hone it and smooth it. And that over time, these, these hormonal electrical uh, nerve impulses hone out and smooth the, 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 the trans, uh, not the transport, the, 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 the transmission of the, um, chemicals and electrical impulses through a very smooth channel so that it goes faster and faster and faster until there's no thought left you don't think it's just this chemical process that flows very very smoothly mm. um, and that was some science done recently on what's taking place chemically and electrically in the body which is interesting all right so let, let's get down to this thing you brought up twice already the difference between a style and the system my personal interpretation of this, and of course, uh, everybody has uh, differing views. Um, so I put the caveat in whatever people think is great. My view is that the, the style is the stylistic interpretation. It's the external, the outside layer, like the, the uniform. This is the style that I wear. The system embodies the complete knowledge passed down through generations of all of the different training practices, methods, skills, theory, and history uh, with, with all the, the Chinese medicine, or necessar not necessarily, but there's many layers to it. It's a systematic approach to practice in differing on breadth and depth, whereas the style is just what you visually see. So people say that's eagle, claw style, eagle style, the praying mantis style, uh, the, 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 you know, whatever you see as a style is the, 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 the eye candy. So styles and system. You can practice the modern performance competing wushu eagle style, but it's not the system. Hmm. That's how I differentiate between the two. Stylistic interpretation is not the same as a systematic approach to fighting, uh, Gong, internal training, theory, philosophy, and everything that goes with it. 
would you say that is comparable to something like uh, we have French cuisine, uh, which is very well structured in, in terms of its teaching methods. You learn it in professional schools. It's, it's a very long-standing tradition. And, but within French cuisine, there are a lot of styles. Every chef you know, creates his own style within that broader system. Would that, would that be a fair comparison? Um, I would say that, that they are following the system and adding their flair, but they're following the system. Mm. It's not, it's, it's French cuisine with a chef's personal flair on top, but it's French cuisine. It's, it's the cooking method. Mm. You know, they, they haven't deviated from that. So it's not like um, Italian cuisine with French flair. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's different. Systems are systems, in my view. At the moment, of course, it can change over time. Nothing is fixed, but that's how I interpret styles and systems. So, styles, you know, you, you can go and learn a, a, a taolu, a routine. You, you can, I, I can come to you, learn bagua uh, routine. You can come to me, learn eagle claw routine. Doesn't mean say I have the bagua system. It doesn't mean say you have the eagle claw system. You have a stylistic representation. Hmm. What so do you think? Let me pick up the, the position of devil's advocate here. And let me ask you from a cynical point of view, why do we need systems? So, I'm, I'm, and, and let me also say why I ask this. You know, nowadays in Western culture, we reinvent the wheel. We say, yeah. oh, you know, I, I, have, I have my own thing going on. People, they decide. You know, what, the, the funny thing I always tell people in, in the United States right now, in the early 2000s, a lot of uh, MMA schools want to be Krav Maga because Krav Maga is big. So you see an MMA school putting up a Krav Maga sign selling their, their Krav Maga school. It brings a lot of students. Krav Maga has a good reputation worldwide. Uh, whether deserved or undeserved, that's for another podcast I'm going to do with uh, a famous uh, teacher, Avi Nardia Sensei, whose uh, expertise about that history. But in Israel, the opposite happens. And you see people who have Krav Maga schools putting up MMA signs. Because MMA is very popular in Israel, but Krav Maga is everywhere. So, I mean, nowadays, we can just make our own thing. And in medicine, for instance, Western medicine, uh, often the doctors would say, oh, you know, that book is 60 years old. What can I possibly learn from a medical book that's 60 years old? That's so old. Haven't we rediscovered the whole world since then. So here, here you are, Julian, representing um, a system that's uh, probably uh, at least uh, 150, 200 years old, right? It and dates back to Yufei uh, as, as the root of the system. Yes, um, so, so that's, that's, sorry, just a sec. So that's several centuries old. And, and me being devil's advocate, I ask you, why do we need something so old? Why do we need systems when we can just reinvent everything to fit the modern? And what do you say to that? Choose whichever path makes you happiest. <laughs> That's it. That's all I've got to say on it. Um, I've explained my, my view between systems and styles. And if you want to do a style, do a style. If you want to do a system, do a system. I've explained my view on the differences between the two. I can't speak for Krav Maga and MMA. I know nothing. Uh, I cannot speak from a position of knowledge. So and I have no comment on that. Okay. So let me ask you that in a in different way, a positive way. Uh, tell us about the value that is contained in systems in preserving such traditions. Um, <clears throat> if you follow the Confucian um, philosophy within Chinese culture, respect your ancestors, respect your teachers, respect your elders, um, even if they are, even if you fall, fall out with your, your teachers or your elders, if you separate, if you divorce, still respect people. Um, so Confucian philosophy has this very ingrained process within Chinese culture that's part of the system approach within Chinese martial arts. If you, some people say yes, some people say no. 
if when you get into the culture, you get into the abstract thinking that's within Chinese culture and within Chinese martial arts. And it does make it easier for you to learn at a, uh, a deeper level than if you try and overlay a straight linear Western thought pattern to abstract Chinese culture and martial arts. You could say in Taiji, grasp the sparrow's tail or waving hands in clouds. These are very visual um, uh, and codified as well slightly within their description. So to a Western linear mind, well, grasp the sparrow's tail means nothing. You have to go into the abstract nature of it to understand it. Um, it's really horses for courses. People can spend a lot of time in styles and still not really feel fulfilled. Then they start looking deeper and they want to go deeper within a practice. To go deeper within a practice, you then need a system of practice. I see. So I think that's my answer. All right. That's fair enough. So essentially, um, first of all, respecting people, obviously Confucius never heard of the internet. <laughs> we don't have such values nowadays. But uh, yes, uh, Julian mentioned Confucius and Confucianism, and he was a Chinese philosopher and scholar that lived uh, roughly uh, 500 years before Christ. And a lot of Chinese culture and part of that Chinese martial arts are affected by his teachings he didn't actually write anything uh, he worked on and, and translated and edited the works of uh, ancestors in Chinese culture and he taught orally and his students wrote a lot of what he had said some some very short texts are said to be written by him by but overall like some of the ancient Greek philosophers it was his students and his descendants who wrote down a lot of his teachings. And we would get more deeply into Confucianism, uh, perhaps this interview or other interviews and lectures on this podcast. So now, Julian, let's uh, focus once more on your uh, very unique system. And maybe first you would like to, to tell listeners how you came about such an interesting martial art, which I, I think, again, no, no one in Western culture, uh, when they're eight years old, think that, oh, you know, I'm going to do something interesting with that eagle claw. It's something that we don't really have in our uh, everyday lives and, and culture. And um, suddenly you find yourself in that system. Tell us how that happened. Certainly. Before I do that, though, I'm just going to add one little thing to the <clears throat> topic of Confucian philosophy. When you aspire to the highest ideals of Confucian philosophy, they are very positive, constructive and very beneficial to, to life. Then you add the process of ego within the corruption of the human mind and very often and people should be very careful to maintain objectivity blind loyalty is the loyalty of a fool confucian philosophy when applied with not necessarily the highest aspirations can be, become a weaponized tool of ideological control and manipulation so please, the listener, bear in mind objective, balanced view of, of things. Um, so how did I end up doing Eagle Claw? Um, I started Chinese martial arts in England at about the age of 17. I did some two and a half, three years of uh, Sancho, freestyle kickboxing, fighting that was very popular over here in, in, in England. Um, I'd seen the Bruce Lee films, the Jackie Chan films, um, the Water Margin, um, and seen these, these additional sort of skills that really were appealing. And I found a Northern Shaolin school over here. <clears throat> I started training in Northern Shaolin, which I enjoyed very much. The system was a bit eclectic. Uh, the, the, the head, the, the, the teacher who ran the association, um, 
had studied a number of different styles from uh, Hongxing Chuolefa to Baksulam, Northern Shaolin, uh, Tai Chi uh, Praying Mantis, uh, Eagle Claw, some uh, Haokun monkey boxing, and, and taught an eclectic mix of different things. Now, I want to comment for listeners that this is a most uh, unusual combination. Although you could find teachers here and there that uh, would teach <laughs> several styles, it's not common that someone really knows uh, as many, not to mention that one would teach several styles from uh, very different parts of China with very different body mechanics. So that would make for an interesting mix. It did make for an interesting mix. And, and as you said, the different body mechanics would take you in different directions. Um, and in my, my, my approach is, you know, if you want to get good at something, you really have to get good at one thing first. Um, or, or, you know, less is more. And later on, you, it's, it's easier for you to do more things. So, um, <clears throat> what would you say, um, um, let me just ask you here, would you say it's necessary to have the upwards of 10,000 hours in one system before you go and try another system? Or maybe we could have a little bit less? Um, I think each person's personal approach will, will guide them in that. For my approach is, I need to fully immerse myself in one thing, fully embrace the system, the training methods, the thinking, the, 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 the approach. Um, so I think everybody has to be guided by their own heart and what they want to achieve and get out of it. For me, I, I wanted to get very good at something and to do that, I had to specialize. So uh, I then went off to Hong Kong um to track down more about the, the eagle claw system and in hong kong uh, i visited the hong kong chinese martial arts association whose very famous president um, was uh, master chan hong jong of the hong Ga, uh, family and uh, the hong kong chinese martial arts association had many great masters uh, within it and teachers and they had a, a huge a huge uh, presence and, and a lot of respect. Before, before continuing to telling us about Hong Kong, <coughs> I just want to um, make something clear here. So the, the Eagle Claw system was originally from northern China, right? Correct. So, so would you like to just say a few words about how it came to be that you ended up looking for it in Hong Kong while actually it's originally from northern China? Because um, the only links and connections that I had initially were out to Hong Kong. So I, I went to Hong Kong because that's where the, the, the Eagle Claw system was being taught that I was aware of. So oh yeah, but what I meant was uh, how did the system find itself so far away from uh, its original location? I'll come on to that at the end of, because I need to answer your first question first sure. before I jump to that, yeah. So when I was in Hong Kong, uh, visited the Hong Kong Chinese Martial Arts Association and uh, became very good friends with a famous uh, uh, Baksulam Northern Shaolin teacher called uh, uh, Long Kaiming, Long Kaiming Master, Grandmaster Long Kaiming as he's called now. <coughs> and he, um, he guided me to the uh, most well known Eagle Claw family within Hong Kong which was from uh, Liu Fa-Mang, also in Cantonese, Lao Fa-Mang. Um, and then he told me who was teaching from that lineage that he, he could direct me to. Uh, and that's the, 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 the branch that I initially started with, uh, with one of the, the daughters of Liu Fa-Mang, um, Master Liu Manyun. And I spent many happy years with uh, Liu Manyun Shufu. Um, uh, in the in the Hong Kong branch of uh, Eagle Claw. Could you tell us in what year did you get to Hong Kong the first time? I was out in Hong Kong in 1990. 1990, okay. So would you like to describe to listeners before uh, moving on, how was it, you know, visiting, living in Hong Kong during the, the early 1990s? 
Hong Kong for me is an amazing place. I absolutely loved Hong Kong. Um, I would spend a good period of time, but the predominant training uh, under Shufu Liu Manyun was in the USA as she'd moved over to there. But Hong Kong, I absolutely loved. Um, and I still love Hong Kong to this day, although you know I've seen a lot of changes. When I was first there, uh, the, the Shenzhen border um, was just fields. <laughs> with, with buffalo. Just the Shenzhen, the, the new economic zone, the, mm -hmm. the, the border between Hong Kong and, and China, which is, as you go up from Hong Kong, which is called Shenzhen, Shenzhen or Shenzhen in, in Cantonese, you know, there was still a lot of very rural farmland, hills, mountains, hmm. um, but it's just exploded over the years now to <clears throat> be high rise, major futuristic metropolis out there. You know, Shenzhen is the, uh, the sort of Silicon Valley of China in many ways. So it's changed a lot, but Hong Kong still has a certain rhythm and pulse that uh, I, I always love. So the journey of Eagle Claw to now get on, so, I'll, so now answer, I'll now answer the next question for you um, and uh, say how Eagle Claw moved from Hebei province, which is connected to Beijing and how it came down to Hong Kong. Hmm. So um, we touched on it briefly earlier that uh, Yufei is, we attribute back to being the root of the system. Uh, Eagle Claw is based on something called Yushu Sansho. Yushu Sansho is Yu family free fighting, which is, as they say, as in, in the sort of old textbooks, was the, the military fighting skills that Yufei taught his soldiers. So, you, so would you like to mention for, for listeners who Yufei was? Yufei was a, a very famous Chinese general who lived during the Song Dynasty, uh, and he was most noticeable, notice, not noticeable, most notable for fighting against the invading Mongol or Jurchen armies from the far north in Mongolia. Um, he's famous within Chinese history. Uh, for his loyalty and um, upstanding character. There's a huge temple in uh, Hangzhou dedicated to his memory, when they call it Yufei Temple. So Yushu Sanshou is the root of our system. Now, uh, Yushu Sanshou, so the stories go, Yushu Sanshou was brought into Shaolin Temple many, many centuries ago and taught as a separate specific skill. Um, kept within the Shaolin Temple and taught as part of their 72 arts and skills. <coughs> um, and kept within the Shaolin Temple for a, few, a good few centuries. Now, to, to say where Eagle Claw started as we know it in a more public way, the founder of today's Eagle Claw is a gentleman from a small village in Xiongshan province, which is part of Hebei. The village is called Gu Zhuangtou, and it means the, the lonely village. Yu Shijun was a traveling tobacco salesman, so he would push a cart of tobacco and, and sell it. He already was well versed in two systems of Chinese martial arts that were very popular in the area. One was called Ba Fan Shou, Eight Flashing Palms, and also Liu He Chuan, Six Harmony Boxing. Whilst traveling, he took refuge in a temple, Buddhist temple in Tianjin province, Tianjin area, from a thunderstorm. Whilst in the temple, nothing to do, so he practiced his Ba Fan Shou and uh, Liu He Chuan, Six Harmony Boxing, but primarily the Ba Fan Shou. There were two Buddhist monks there, so the story goes, uh, who watched him practice and said, well, your, your Kung Fu is good for demonstrating, but no good for fighting. So Liu Shi Zhen had, you know, a lot of experience in, in fighting, because on the roads, you bandits and robbers and all sorts of stuff. 
so he said, well, okay, uh, I think my skill is good. Let's, let's exchange. So he exchanged in a test of skill and was defeated easily three times by these two monks, uh, uh, Fatsing, Douqi. And then after being defeated easily three times, he asked to learn the skill. And they taught Liu Shijun, the Yu Shu Sancho, Yu family free fighting. When Liu Shijun returned back, he started teaching it in the village. And he also traveled down to the court in Beijing and was teaching in the army ballot barracks, uh, teaching the military there. Okay, so <coughs> just to, so we can have context, uh, what time frame are we roughly talking about? 17 to 1800s. Okay, so does that, this is during the last uh, imperial dynasty of China, the Qing dynasty. Yeah. And he started combining the Yushu Sancho with the Ba Fansho that he knew and started evolving and developing and bringing together his skill sets. So they recognize Liu Shijun as being the modern day founder of the Ying Zhao Fanzi Quan system. From there, it, he passed it down from, from Liu Shijun. It was taught to, and this is, these are all family members within the village of Gu Zhuangtou. From Liu Shijun, it was taught to Liu Chengyou. Liu Chengyou taught his son and his nephew. His son was Liu Qiwen, and his nephew was Chen Zicheng, uh, also called Chen Jiping. Chen Jiping was very famous for Eagle Claw, which I'll touch on in a moment. Still being taught in the village, um, as, as my teacher's family learned directly through uh, the Liu Qiwen and the students and the, the Shushong or older brothers um, within the family. So how did Eagle Claw travel from the north down south? Many of your listeners may, and I'm sure everybody's heard of the famous uh, Shanghai Jin Wu Association. Uh, yes, maybe uh, a lot of listeners have heard about it. Uh, if not, it is an association and a school that were set up in the beginning of the 20th century. And I think it's 1920s and 30s, maybe. No, but probably by the, the late 30s, it, it was. Was it still around late 30s? It was open in. Uh, it was the second building that they had was 1915. So they were they were probably around because their first building was all wood and was destroyed in a storm. Um, so they were probably around 1912, 1910. Okay. And their the building was brick and mortar, it was 1915. <clears throat> All right, so it was a school that uh, sought out to, on one hand, preserve traditional Chinese martial arts, and on the other hand, to modernize them in certain ways, make them more accessible to the public. Perhaps a, a vision of trying to make traditional Chinese martial arts to, to be accepted by the public like sports. Uh, they had all sorts of uh, interesting social experiments. They adopted modern uniforms. Uh, perhaps one of the first places in China where you could see people in, in uh, mass produced uniforms as opposed to uh, Chinese martial arts beforehand usually were uh, trained in just plain everyday clothing unless there was a ceremonial demonstration or if it was in, in a temple. Um, they also uh, attempted at times mimicking uh, Western culture, maybe as a gist, some, at times to, to attract students, they took pictures of themselves in all sorts of uh, interesting attire. There's uh, pictures from that period from the Jingwu school uh, of students dressed with um, what looks to be like uh, almost uh, tiger or leopard skins like in the old uh, Tarzan movies, uh, which was a very uh, Western idea for an attire that they mimicked uh, in order to look more modern. It was during a period in, in China's history where the Chinese people felt that their traditions were perhaps weak or failing them. And also the Western powers uh, who were um, bullying China economically and militarily, uh, they were putting them down and a lot of Chinese people felt, oh, you know, it's because we are too traditional. We haven't continued to evolve our, our culture and our technology as the Westerners had done. 
It has to do with a lot of historical processes that we won't get into here, but the Jingwu school was a part of that sort of wave of, on one hand, Chinese nationalism to try to preserve culture, and on the other hand, uh, attempting to also modernize and experimenting with. It. So please continue, Julian. Yeah, so the Shanghai, uh, Shanghai Jingwu Association was strengthen the nation, wasn't it? Strengthen the nation through uh, various activities, martial arts, um, academics, and, and all sorts of things. So a call was put out um, in the uh, you know, early 1900s, at the early stages of the, the Shanghai Jingwu Association, to bring strong teachers to, to help grow the, the Jingwu Association uh, and develop the martial arts. One of those teachers who answered the call was <coughs> Chan Zicheng, who learned uh, from Liu Changyou. And Chan Zicheng was the nephew in so far as he had married Liu Qiwen's sister. Liu Qiwen was the son of Liu Changyou. Chan Zicheng was from a neighboring village called Li Lingduang. And he came down to Shanghai and Eagle Claw had never been seen uh, in the South before. Um, and Chan Zicheng was a very strong, very competent uh, practitioner of Eagle Claw and started teaching Eagle Claw. It became very popular. So he called others from our village to travel down. So you had uh, Liu Zhishang, Liu Jiangwu, Li Baoying, and also Liu Famang, uh, Zhang Zhongwen. So you had a number of people come down from the village in uh, Xiongqian to assist and teach uh, Eagle Claw. So <coughs> the Shanghai Jingwu started to develop and propagate. Uh, Chan Zichong went to Singapore. He was teaching there for a while. Um, people like uh, Lei Peixian came down to Guangzhou and was teaching Eagle Claw in Canton. Li Baoying uh, and Li Baoying's classmate, Liu Famang, were teaching in Foshan. And then from Foshan, Liu Famang went to uh, Hong Kong, was teaching there. Uh, Chan Zichong's student, Liang Zipeng, was teaching in Hong Kong as well, Eagle Claw. So then Eagle Claw really started to spread because it was very famous through the Shanghai, Shanghai Jingwu Association. And it went to Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, and, and across China. So I noticed two interesting things here. First of all, I very much like that you, you keep saying our village, that you're a part of the village. Yes, yeah, very much so. Um, my journey into Eagle Claw and the constant uh, pursuit of knowledge and excellence um, drove me to, 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 to seek more um, depth, more depth and more depth. And I found my, <clears throat> I started researching deeper into China in sort of 2007 and started visiting. Uh, the, I, what I wanted to do as somebody who's very interested in the history of things as well, I conducted the first, um, the first Westerner to conduct a historical travelogue uh, survey of the journey of Eagle Claw, which is why I know, you know about the path of it. So I met people in uh, Canton, in Foshan, in Hangzhou, in Shanghai, um, in Beijing, in Tianjin, and Hebei. So I, and then eventually went Xiongxian and into the village. So I travelled the journey, meeting many great practitioners of Eagle Claw, um, and you know it really broadened my understanding of the system and also the depth. And I started finding layers of Eagle Claw that I had not come across before. And um, I needed to move into that path. I needed to move into the depths of the system. <clears throat> so um, further research journeys into the village. I visited the village um, a, a good few times. And we're talking um, about the original village of the founder of Modern Eagle Claw, right? That's right. The, the place where Liu Shijun lived. So I've been to the house. Uh, where uh, Liu Shijun's house, I've been to the house and met the family of Liu Changyou, uh, Liu Qiwen, stood on the ground, if you like, the dirt, stood on the same dirt and the earth where the ancestors of our system trained and practiced every day. And 
it has a certain resonance. So is it, did, I want to, to relate this to <coughs> the second thing that I didn't mention earlier, that I noticed that uh, you were talking about, that this broader Gong Fu family of Eagle Claw was very cooperative. You keep talking about people helping each other. This guy comes to this city to support that other guy and help him out. Uh, I would say, first of all, often in Chinese martial arts, uh, sadly, that is not the case. People become each other's competitors, each other's enemies even. And over the generations, they're not as cooperative. But here we're, we're seeing a tradition that consistently for centuries, people supporting each other. And I think that's great. And maybe that could also explain how you're talking about traveling all over China and looking at the spread of the system. Now, today, we, we look at something like uh, young style Tai Chi Chuan or Chin style Tai Chi Chuan. And we say, oh, you know, how widespread are these? But actually, these systems were, are so widespread because they were very strongly supported by the Chinese Communist Party. Most other systems did not become very widespread, you know, without government support. But here we have Eagle Claw, which is famous in China. It's really all over the place. Would you say that it was because of the values and standards in uh, interpersonal interaction that they are in this tradition? Um, I think if you're teaching sincerely, you shouldn't worry about politics. Um, politics in many ways are a poison. Um, people come, people go, people have different views, different approaches, people fall out, people disagree, people harmonize. <clears throat> At the end of the day, we, we only have one life. Um, and it's very short, it's very fragile. Uh, we should just try to do the best we can. It is every single person's responsibility to develop, evolve and grow day by day. Um, you can't be the same person you were 10 years ago. And if you are, then you've not moved forward at all. Hmm. I think, you know, I mean, of course, there's, if, if we take, um, for example, like you say, Yang style Tai Chi or Wing Chun or any system that spreads more widely, you'll have disagreements. You'll have people saying they haven't got it, they know better, or this. You know what? Just don't care about all that. All that. I'm not interested in talking politics. I'm not interested in hearing people's uh, this, that, and the other. You know, it's just live your life, do the best you can, um, train your train your kung fu. Uh, if somebody knows more, okay. But you have you have a responsibility to yourself as an individual and you have a responsibility to the system to do the best that you can with within the system otherwise it will die some people talk about oh holding secret knowledge there is knowledge and it it doesn't get released all the time or straight away you know there's stuff i'm sure you've learned from your teachers that's only come to you over time they open up more and more and more. We must be careful to recognize when protection becomes deception. Hmm. Yeah, we must be and then, careful. And then to you end up uh, with a system in which the, the Shifu unfortunately takes the, that knowledge to the grave. Sometimes they take that knowledge to the grave. Sometimes they may know it. Sometimes they may not know it. Um, I think that we, if, if we teach sincerely, we teach openly and we teach as much as we can. This way we, we honor the ancestors of the system, those that came before us in Confucian philosophy. We, the greatest tragedy is for a system to die through one person saying, ah, I'm taking the secret to my grave. Oh, that's a tragedy. You know, there's, there's, there's hundreds of years of knowledge is just flushed down or <laughs> burned in the crematorium. Mm. And, and I know some people do that and they say it's the right thing to do. Okay, all right. Okay, that's your opinion. You know, I, I can't speak for, for that. Um, if you don't teach openly, then you're hiding stuff. You, you have to be open and you have to be true. 
So I think we have a responsibility to ourselves as individuals to achieve the very best that we can and, and go forwards always. We have a responsibility to do the very best that we can by the system that we're learning and we must get to the very depth of it as much as we possibly can. Otherwise, it dies or it becomes diluted to the point of just performance, dance, wushu, performance. I think earlier you were alluding to also the, to the phenomenon of pearls before swine in terms of teaching martial arts that on one hand we want to be open, on the other hand uh, you can take a, a student on his first month of training and show them all of the secrets but it does it, uh, they, they would look at it and it's like what's that? I can't do that so it doesn't matter. This is true. Um... You know, the very high level of skills or the very high level of understanding comes through like the word Kung Fu means a skill or attribute developed through time and effort. Chinese martial arts is abstract as much as we try and simplify it and make it easy to learn and easy to understand. Things only refine over time and you reach moments of realization where you understand and embody something and then you go up a level. <clears throat> so yeah you can put pearls before swine you can put you know the greatest scientific discoveries in a book in front of somebody and if they can't even do basic math they've got no chance um, so i think we, we we might have a lot of listeners that are in the process of just start, starting to to practice martial arts or maybe it's they're kind of in their maybe first three or four or five years of training or perhaps uh, their experience previously is with um, more sports oriented things like uh, judo, MMA, boxing, Muay Thai, all really excellent systems, by the way. And, but what, what is shared with uh, these systems is that most of the stuff that you're going to learn, you're going to see in your first year of training. So oftentimes it is said, for instance, uh, with judo, that the black belt would know, uh, depending on the school, yeah, but the black belt would often know the same amount of techniques uh, that a student would know after one or one half years of training. But he would do them much, much better with more refined understanding and, and better timing much more complex and nuanced body mechanics, etc. So with some systems and styles, it's all right there on the table. Very quickly, you get to see everything. With other systems and styles, what happens is, as it's, it's akin to us growing older as human beings, uh, we might be nine years old and we have lived for life for nine years, but it doesn't mean that at nine years old we understand sexual relations or even romantic relationships or war. These are things that might take a person 16 or 20 or even 50 years to, to start to comprehend. So things in life have many layers and sometimes it is true that in, with certain types of skills and systems and experiences, it does take quite a lot of time, sometimes even decades to get down to really deep comprehension of what we're dealing with. So yes, unfortunately, um, some things take time, but, but then the uh, teachers are not always patient and then they keep to themselves. And what we could end up with is that tragedy that um, Julian was talking about of having a teacher with a lot of knowledge that takes much of that knowledge with him to the grave or with her because they feel that people were not up to standards, so they did not meet them halfway. I think, is it, is to summarize that, <clears throat> the advanced is the basics just done really, really well. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you really, I mean, um, Shrifo Julian is very eminent authority uh, on Eagle Claw by the virtue of actually going there to China to the to the roots to where the, to the origin of that spring 
and, and finding out about the language and the people and their culture and traditions. And I want to ask you as someone who was there more than once and studied there, how do you feel that, that say the terrain that they lived in in that village might have affected the way the art is practiced? Because obviously it's not New York City. No, um, it's a farming village. So the, once you turn off the uh, main highway uh, onto the side roads, you're going onto dirt road. There's no, there's no tarmac. Um, sometimes it's just uh, bricks or cobble on the road, but it's predominantly just earth dirt roads. Um, you mentioned earlier that I always refer to it as our family village. <clears throat> It is the family village of all of our Eagle Claw. It's the root and the source. For me to say it's my family village is because I'm the first Westerner to be accepted as a Baisha lineage disciple into the family within Eagle Claw in the founding village. So it is my village. I, I live with my family, my Eagle Claw family. I live with them, train with them, eat with them, sleep you know, in the same house. <clears throat> so, um, I, I, yeah, the, it is my village, my family out there. So the training's very, you know, it's very basic. There's not much luxuries. When I was first there, you know, there's no plumbed in toilets. So the, the, the bathroom was a hole in the ground with a plank of wood and straw. And that's, that's the, the amount of luxury that we had. It has changed a bit since then, though. And you're talking... Or as, as late as the 2000s, they still had a, a hole in the ground as their toilet. Yeah. Yeah, okay. It's not, not now, they have them. You know, things have moved forward quite a lot. So, you know, things have developed and, uh, and improved. But yeah, when I was first there, it was just plank of wood across a big pit. Um, and it was straw and, and sand that went in there. It was, uh, yeah, great experiences. Yeah, well, in today, in the spirit of progressivism, we often think that more is better than that more sophisticated is better than the traditional, the older. And what happens often is you see people have access to all of these devices. You know, they, they can have 20 different training instruments in a small room, but they end up not using any of them. And when you live in such a village and, and you don't even have the materials, you can't order that stuff off Amazon. Well, that sets up your priorities, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a remote village and the electricity would go off at certain times in the day so that the electricity could all be given to the factories. So, you know, at nighttime, they would turn electricity off in the whole village. So they can conserve it for the next day and things like that. So you'd only have, you know, powered electricity du during certain hours. I mean, that's, it's much better now, but they still have power outages for, for factory use. Um, I, I should also note that I'm very grateful for the journey that I've been on and to have learned under eminent teachers uh, and met so many uh, highly skilled practitioners. Um, uh, I, I also study uh, Tai Chi with a, a teacher from Hangzhou in West China, uh, Master Chen Chengji. And uh, I also have skills, methods, theories, concepts and principles that I've learned from a gentleman that you know, Dr. Kenneth Fish, mm -hmm. uh, who's been very good to me over the years. Of course, all the, all the, the, the knowledge and training that I had with Shuvu uh, Liu Manyun. Um, but I... I want to publicly acknowledge and say thank you to uh, Yarek Szymanski from Shanghai, who was very helpful in my early um, endeavours and adventures and travels into the village, who travelled with me and worked as a translator and, and helped me. So yeah, thanks to Yarek for all of his help. Um, I in just those early to, days. to mention these two individuals, Dr. Kenneth Fish and Yarek Szymanski, are foremost uh, practitioners and scholars of the traditional Chinese martial arts. Uh, they're well known, especially amongst the uh, practitioners of the internal Chinese martial arts in, in the West, at least in the uh, English speaking countries. And I would gather Yarek in his uh, homeland of Poland. Um, Dr. Fish is, is a, a doctor in, in chiropractic, right? Yeah, he's a chiropractic doctor, very, very good. Um, 
his primary systems are Xing Yichuan, uh, old Lohan Shaolin boxing, and Wu Xing Tongfei. Those are, but you know, those are the systems that he's very, very deeply skilled at, and his um, chiropractic knowledge, anatomy, physiology, and understanding of body mechanics was very, very helpful for me. Um, was able to explain a lot of the deeper skills that were taking place and how to train methods that um, I'd not come across before. So from Dr. Kenneth Fish, I've, I've learned body mechanics, skills, methods, theories, um, and principles that helped my eagle claw, helped my Tai Chi. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I spend a lot of time talking with him and to, to Yarek, uh, who uh, with their language skills as well, because Dr. Fish um, speaks uh, very fluent Chinese as does uh, Yarek. So uh, they, they've been helpful in, in helping sort of pull apart some rather abstract concepts and make them more easy for me to understand and then go away and try and practice. Yeah. I want to add that uh, Yarek Zimanski uh, is considered really a formal scholar on Taoism, who is uh, widely traveled all over China and he's seeking monks and temples in remote regions and doing a lot of uh, fantastic uh, documentary work on these people and their traditions. So uh, if there are listeners who are uh, really deeply, not, not superficially, deeply interested in Chinese culture and Taoism and they want to reach out to Yarek, um, they can reach out to me. I'll, I'll uh, send you his uh, Facebook account his, or his email. He's a very friendly person. And, and really uh, quite accessible and uh, would gladly help other people with such an interest. Uh, so going back uh, to, to your village, the Eagle Claw village, uh, I want to ask, so Eagle Claw is a system uh, known to, to have specialized in many uh, gripping methods. And I wonder, uh, this probably has a connection with the sort of physical labor they traditionally do in that village, I would gather, right? Well, I think a lot of these old practices are based on you know, physical labor because if we, if we even touch on uh, the Xing Yichuan, you know, Xing Yichuan can say, you, you could say that a lot of the, the qi, bang, uh, splitting and pounding comes from heavy spear work and, and the sword work. Mm -hmm. um, more more knowledgeable than I on that, but um, it, you look at the three section staff, uh, the Sanji uh, one. The three section staff is a long rice flail that they used to beat the rice the, of uh, the, 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 the wheat from the chaff. So a lot of these farming instruments became weapons. So yeah, I mean in. Uh, <clears throat> And some people will say the Chen Star Tai Chi in Chen Zhao Guo. Chen Zhao Guo was a farming village. So they would pick up heavy bales of hay and you'll see a lot of the throwing skills from Chen Zhao Guo. It's oh, actually, you know, with, now that you say that, a lot of things in Chen Tai Chi would work very well with uh, tossing, hay, uh, tossing that, that, uh, that stuff around, you know? Mm. It, it certainly makes sense uh, with the body mechanics of the art. Yeah, so Eagle Claw, you know, we, we have many what they call Wai Gong, external or physical training, having, uh, throwing heavy bags of, of stone uh, or ball bearings, uh, lifting pots, lots of exercises for strengthening. Um, and you start on the outside, Wai Gong, and then you go into the Nei Gong, and you start training the ligaments and tendons because you refine the way you do it and your body strengthens at the fascial level, the, the joint level, the tendon level over time. Because they say in Chinese martial arts, as we know, that the muscular strength of the body over time and age decreases, but the ligament strength, the tendon strength doesn't uh, atrophy in the same way. Mm -hmm. so, Refined body mechanics, tendon and ligament strength gives you strength for a long, long time into your, much into your later years. Oh, I think we see that a lot with uh, older gentlemen, sometimes in their 80s and 90s, they still have the grip strength they had at 30. Yeah, and if not more. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. True. because in some ways, because they sort of become, um, I wouldn't say stiffer, 
but their their ligaments become more uh, well fused together over the years, it's not as easy to to unbalance that sort of grip. No, it's not. Um, and when you use eagle claw, your eagle claw gripping should it extend through the the body all the way down to your toes mm -hmm. yeah that that's a very uh, nice and interesting remark i think that a lot of people tend to focus and that that's something that uh, a lot of beginners even after five sometimes after 10 years in the martial arts tend to do they would focus their attention and their energy on the area that does the action but usually you should actually be focused on the area that's farthest away from that. So let's give an example. So if, if you're trying to uh, avoid someone putting a joint lock on you, even that if that person is in an advantageous position, you actually have to completely let go of the joint, where almost entirely let go of the joint, where someone's trying to put the joint lock on and instead move all of the rest of the body and especially the parts of the body farthest away from that area and use them to manipulate yourself out of that situation. Of course, there's a lot more to it, uh, the way you hold your tendons, the way you move your dantian, but generally speaking, that, that would usually be good advice. Yeah. If you fight force with force, the stronger of the two is going to win. Mm -hmm. um, so circles... Circles and spirals move in straight lines. Um, you know, uh, cut a circle with a straight line, dissolve a straight line with a circle. I'd like to include here a very short story I was told by a colleague of mine. And I think he took that one from Rory Miller, uh, who is the foremost expert on uh, personal security, is a famous martial arts teacher. And uh, whether Rory Miller or not, it's a true story. At one point, there was footage in an American prison, that's from recent years, and they were seeing one prisoner holding uh, a small object in his hand, and there were several prisoners standing behind him, and they were mimicking him as if in a dance, and moving in all sorts of very strange ways. And the, the prison guards initially like didn't know what to make of this. Like, what were these people doing? In a short time, a few days, they figured out what happened was that the, uh, the internal, I, I wouldn't know if that was, would be the right name, the SWAT teams in the prison, the teams that uh, need to uh, put down a mutiny in the prison in a, in a very dire sort of uh, situation, extreme circumstances, they switched their protective uniforms and their, their shields and their vests changed. And now they're of a different shape. And what that prisoner was doing with the other prisoners, he had figured out what are the best angles to use their improvised shanks to stab those prison guards through their new protective equipment, what, were the, the, weak, what the weak points were, and he was actually developing a martial art form and teaching it to the other prisoners to suit their needs. So I, I'm, the reason I'm telling this story is this is how uh, martial arts form develop. And this is how in, in societies, you know, the void, the, the prison environment is almost entirely disengaged in daily life most of the time from the external world. And it's the same as a remote village. And in such sort of um, circumstances and places, people go for what's practical. They form solutions for the immediate challenges that they face, and they use the objects and the movements that come about from their everyday life experience. So uh, this is a comment essentially about how the villagers, and not just in, in the Eagle Claw village, also famously in Okinawa, the way they develop their, um, the weapons they used in Kobudo, complementary set of martial arts with weapons, complementary to Okinawan karate, and in, in countless villages across China, and the way they developed their martial arts forms. It was all meant to 
meet with the demands, the, the things they had to deal with on an everyday basis using the tools and the circumstances that they have. And we see, we, we think it's primitive. We think, oh, it's old school. Yeah, well, it's so old school. You see it in prison still nowadays. People use what they have. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> I want to go back to uh, your experience with the village. So you initially were, you were totally disengaged from what was going on with Eagle Claw in mainland China because Hong Kong is the southernmost part of China. It's a, it's a separate, geographically speaking, it's a separate island, even though now it's governed by, by the rest of China. And you were not a part of what was going on there, but e eventually you came to be a part of that. How did that happen and why? Uh, I've touched on why earlier insofar as um, my journey took me on the path <clears throat> to look deeper and deeper um, and I in, in my travels I, I started finding different aspects of Eagle Claw um, uh, that just appealed to me uh, for my personal vision and view of Eagle Claw and where I wanted to go with it as a system. Um, could, could you be more, a little bit more specific for people who are not, no? <laughs> okay. So um, I found levels of practice and skills that uh, um, personally just resonated with where I saw Eagle Claw as a system. As I mentioned, Yarek was in incredibly helpful. And over a few visits, I was able to get to, to know the individual teachers and practitioners there, and they got to know me. Um, and as with anything, there's always quite a lot of observation when you're meeting people. They observe you, they observe your character, they see what you do, see how you respond. Um, well, and for, then, for the benefit of um, those less familiar with that sort of traditional environment and with Chinese culture, you know, we might have listeners coming from uh, Japanese martial arts, Indonesian martial arts, sports martial arts. Uh, could, could you, sorry, sorry to cut you off again, could you just uh, give a little bit of perspective, just a minute or two about how it's different with Chinese people and Chinese traditional teachers from China, you know, the, the way that you build trust with them? Um, well, in, in a Western, if, in a Western uh, approach, it's a product, service, and uh, price. You want something? You want to learn it? You want to go to university? You choose your course, pay your money, they teach you, that's it. In Chinese culture, for Kung Fu, they have to know your heart. They have to know your heart and mind and see what kind of a person you are before they will... Uh, start to teach you what is really their family inheritance. So um, you can't just go and knock on a door and say, oh, you know, here's a, here's a bundle of money, teach me this. Well, they might take your money and teach you something, <laughs> but mm. you, you, you know, you're not sure really what you're getting. So you, you, one, you are observed and watched, and two, you should also observe and watch. Over the uh, the various trips that I had there, there was always one teacher who kind of just stood at the back, stayed out of the way, didn't do much, didn't say much. You're talking watched. about a, a certain teacher in the village, right? Yeah, who is now my teacher. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. So he he and uh, he always stood at the back and was always quiet and didn't really get involved with anything and. He was quite standoffish, you know, on the first two or three, two, three visits, he was quite standoffish. And, uh, and then the next visit, I spent time with him at his family home and uh, trained with him there and learned, learned a lot of really good things. <clears throat> and then the next visit, I was spent more time with them. And again, there's lots of, they'll do things or go places and you'll go with them and they'll, they'll see what your reactions are to things and how open you are. And, and really that's, that's the way that both my teacher and I um, got to know each other. And I learned from uh, Chen Jinxin, 
uh, who's my teacher. Uh, and I, with him, I'm by sure to Liu Xu Yun, who was a student of Liu Qi Wen. Okay, so, so just two, two things you mentioned here. First, if you could spell your teacher's name and then also explain, you know, in just a minute or two, what Bai Shi means. So my teacher's name, Chen Junxin, is C-H-E-N for November, J-U-N for November, Xin X-I-N, Chen Junxin. And uh, we, we are all within the Bai Shi disciple inheritor line of eagle claw so the baisha ceremony is a very well for us is a very and for you as i know because i you've shared knowledge and shared uh, things with me on on your view of baisha mm -hmm. for us it's a very serious commitment and a very deep step into the family um my baisha how ceremony long, so so just be, before before you continue uh how long did it take you to gain the trust that allowed you to undergo this baisha ceremony with which you became a part of the family well i knew chen jun shin since 2007 and i baisha formally with him in 2018. okay so 11 years that's a very long time yeah uh but we spent a lot of time doing a lot of things that were very much testing 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 uh, i i yeah i they're very very personal stories but you know if you go somewhere you you there's there's things happening and you're put into situations where you're observed and watched to see your reactions you you're offered to do this or do that you know you choose this is not your culture or but it's ours and how flexible with you how how much will you stay with them and things like that so i mean some people <clears throat> they they become a uh, say a first rank black belt and they have one test but you you had i don't know how many tests for for 11 years straight that's a lot of testing well my teacher is very serious about his inheritance and he's very serious about his eagle claw um, he does not teach many people what he calls the zu ting, zu ting ying zhao. What he means by, by this is the ancestral eagle claw mm. that is passed down in the Bai Shi line. So we have something called the Wu Hu Hui. This is the five tigers eagle claw. This is what is available to everybody. Everybody can learn Wu Hu Hui. The Zhu Ting Ying Zhao is only taught within the Bai Shi line. So it's a deeper level of eagle claw within the family. Um, is there a limit some... to, to the number of people in each generation who could study it? Uh, I don't know. How many people in your generation uh, have accomplished studying? <clears throat> um, well, with, I have uh, five brothers. Um, of which I know two, two are Baisha. So mm -hmm. I have two, two, there's three of us that are directly Baisha, but the Baisha is really in the family family. Your, your name goes on the family blood records, if you like, is in, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're as good as bloodline, even though you're born outside of it, you're considered in the bloodline at that point. I see. Okay. So again for for those who are less familiar you become by you go for the by sure you become part of a family that's literally like a real family in traditional chinese martial arts correct you are you know i have an adopted uh, adopted parents if you like uh with my my teacher and his wife um i have <laughs> acquired two younger a younger sister and a younger brother and they're my family so if my teacher says I want to send my daughter to England for the summer to gain experience uh, and my son, okay, no problem. He pays for their air ticket, I pay for everything else. They're, they're like my family. Mm -hmm. when, when I go there, there's nothing about money. I see a lot of people doing buy sure and it's literally like business. Not oh, yes. There are a lot of teachers nowadays, they, they take on a, a disciple 2D, that, that's the, the term for a, a person who 
underwent the Baisher under a Shifu, a teacher. And they, they not only charge, sometimes they would uh, say, okay, you have to pay me, um, say, $1,000 a year for being my disciple. Right? We see such things. And some people charge like $10,000 to do the Baisher ceremony. Yeah, the ceremony itself. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't pay that. My teacher is not about money. He just doesn't care about it. He has his own business. He has his own life. Um, of course, money in uh, Hongbao, the red packet is involved. Uh, my Baisher ceremony was over two days. It was very in-depth. There were um, three stages to it on the first day and a, a second very intimate uh, uh, stage at the grave graves of our ancestors. <coughs> uh, the Baisher ceremony was witnessed by five brothers. All five had to agree each stage was acceptable in the three stages of the, the, uh, the kotal uh, and burning incense to Yufei, Liu Shijun, and then Liu Shuyun. So the three stages, each stage had to be agreed. And if, if it wasn't agreed or something happened that meant some of the offerings didn't burn properly, that was it, finish. Try again, come back next year. It's a so, very, very deep spiritual um, process that is very meaningful. So once you buy sure, you're very much... So you have something called a Jeongwenyan, which are like the flag bearers. Uh, and it's Cantonese, I, I don't remember the, the Mandarin name for this. Um, so from the Wuhu Hui, which is the public environment, you'll have a specialized group which are called the Zhengmenyan. So they, they fly the flag of the system. Yeah, they're the standard bearers. Mm. Deeper into that is what they call a Guanmunyan. The Guanmunyan is the, you know the Chinese houses which have a square with a courtyard? Yes. The Jeongmunyan are within the courtyard. The Guanmunyan is the, the rooms behind the courtyard, the private quarters of the Shufu. Yeah. That's where the One like, one like uh, what people know is Quan Quan in, in Cantonese is Ho, in, in Mandarin that would be Guan, and the, it's a Ho, means a Ho. A hole? The whole, whole, uh, H-A-L, oh, right. The whole. Yeah. So, and, and also just to, to comment for listeners about the traditional Chinese household, uh, nowadays China is such a crowded place that you don't see these things as much uh, in the cities, more so in the countryside, but essentially uh, there would be a, a house, a villa. The villa would, would have uh, some walls which surround uh, itself and a, and a courtyard, whether it be uh, large or small. And there would be the, the outside areas surrounding the house that are also owned by the family. Um, and then there, there would be traditionally these three levels of students, which would be physically distinguished by where do they practice. So, I mean, ordinary everyday students uh, would often practice outside of the family estate entirely. Uh, there would be uh, either closer students or people who are already disciples who could practice inside of the courtyard. So this is where the, the phrase enter the gate comes from. You enter the gate of the system, you literally used to enter through the gate of the courtyard of the house and practice inside the courtyard. And then the, the foremost disciples are really in very deep with the system. Sometimes only the people who um, so-called inherit the system, or um, some people call these the standard bearers, but essentially the people who are responsible for uh, preserving all of the traditions in the systems and, and, and keeping it and, and bringing it forth for the next generations. These people would train usually individually, one-on-one -on -one, or just two people with the shuffle inside of the house, which is what Julian was talking about inside the hall. Yep, agreed. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, so my teacher, as, as, as I named him, is Chen Chun Xin. Uh, we buy sure through Liu Shuyan to Liu Qiwen, Liu Changyou, and uh, Liu Shuzhen. Um, so we, can, we have this direct line that my, my teacher says, this is the Baishur line. 
the direct in inheritors um, and uh, they're, they're clearly identified and this is this is what they this is the information from the village directly from the village um, and I can only go by that information uh, as that is what my teacher has passed down to me uh, in terms of information um, I want to comment on something else that Julian was just talking about. He was speaking of the Baisha ceremony that he underwent that took three whole days. I think that this is quite unusual and exceptional, very traditional, because uh, nowadays, even in uh, so-called traditional schools, the Baisha ceremony is something that's much shorter. Um, oftentimes, it would take anywhere between five minutes to 30 minutes. Sometimes even as little as two minutes, uh, just an offering of tea and a gift. And also speaking of uh, this notion of what, what do you pay the shuffle, what do you pay the teacher in this traditional relationship to enter into the family? Now, there are a lot of teachers that prefer that uh, nothing of substance would be paid. It, it's symbolic because it's about the relationship being set up and not about someone gaining money or getting money out of someone else. Other times, so what do you do? Traditionally, often they would just hand over a cup of tea and a piece of fruit, and you you basically give something, you know. But it's it's not something that that has any substantial value. Other times, what is also very common and, and is acceptable is that the the student would be asked to bring a red envelope, and the red envelope would include cash money. Uh, at whichever sum that is on one hand respectable and, and that the student sees fit. On, on the other hand, that would be up to standard with that sort of uh, occasion uh, because it, you know, it can be uh, $1, it has to be a bit more of substance if it's already decided that you're gonna give a red envelope. Uh, but unfortunately, um, like Julia mentioned, there are some teachers who charge to tell the student, you have to put in five thousand, ten thousand dollars in that red envelope, or maybe do even a bank transfer or something like that. Now, I, I mean, who are we to judge? Like Julian said, we're not getting into politics. It's not our traditions. So why why should we uh, say anything negative about it? It's it's anyone's right to charge whatever they see fit, and anyone's right to choose to pay what they see fit. However, we're just stating that. Traditionally speaking, usually in Baisha ceremonies, you wouldn't be uh, paying for your nose. <laughs> you would, it would be uh, somewhat more modest because, again, it's not about money, it's about a uh, relationship. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> every year I, I, I give my, my shuffle red packet. Um, and I can tell you now, it is not hundreds and hundreds of pounds. He doesn't charge a, a rate for all my students and things like that. And uh, the red packet, that pays uh, a, a donation to the, the Eagle Claw family. I stay with him. He feeds me. He won't let me spend a penny uh, or, or a cent, a dime, a dollar. All my training is, 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 is just there. So I make a contribution to the, the Eagle Claw family towards the, the Wuguan, the school. Um, and uh, it's, it's really not about money at all, which is very refreshing in these uh, modern days where it's all about big money and paying hundreds of this and got to send big charges every year. And okay, yeah, and it's, and it's fine. It's everybody has their own path. And as you say, who are we to judge? Whichever path you walk, just walk it, be happy. Uh, and carry on but um he's extremely open um and the amount of knowledge that is downloaded into me each time mm -hmm. is, is huge it's absolutely huge and, and i've learned so much in uh, my training with him um, and it, it has changed my view of eagle claw significantly um, and i'm very happy very happy with where I am, what I'm doing, and who I'm learning with. Um, and I wish everybody the same success in Eagle Claw across the world. Be happy, be successful, um, train hard, work hard, and do your best for the system of Eagle Claw. Mm. 
That's a good message indeed. And I want to um, say two things here. First of all, just another uh, tiny comment about money, just to clarify. Why should a disciple keep giving those red envelopes? The reason is that usually uh, once one becomes a 2D a disciple, that person no longer pays a monthly fee and money is not being mentioned. This is why it is expected to contribute to the teacher, especially in times of need, to the best of one's ability. Okay, because the money does not flow on a monthly basis as with regular students. It's a different type of relationship. And now, Julian, you mentioned uh, the, the vast knowledge that's being uh, so-called downloaded into your brain through uh, the kind and generous instruction of your shifu every time you meet with him. And I think this is very important because I find that with our own biological parents, how much information knowledge do we really get from all of what they know? Unfortunately, not a lot. Not a we would be very lucky, people would be very, very lucky if they had gotten as much as 30 or 40 percent of what either their mother or father knows very likely the i think one of the advantages we have with martial arts systems which, which could relate to the previous question i asked you is that these systems allow us to convey a much higher percentage of knowledge and information than is made possible in ordinary relationships which is also why we need this element of trust that the Chinese create for this um, master-disciple relationship so that we could have this smoother, uh, more refined and, and higher level of transmission of knowledge, which is not usually made possible with family or friends, right? Yeah, so you have, you have this thing for transmission uh, and some people believe it, some people don't do, believe it. They call it Chun Gong which is transmission of the essence of this system at an energetic or some people will say spiritual level. The, the, the transmission of energy that takes place between the teacher and student. And now within that Baisha line, that transmission has taken place over many generations. So you, you're, you're, you're on what's known as the transmission road. Yeah, it's like the high speed network. <clears throat> it's the 5G of Kung Fu. Mm. Oh, you know what, if, if someone feels that this is getting a bit woo-woo and, and maybe a bit uh, too new agey and strange, maybe you should consider, for instance, the relationship between Mike Tyson and his legendary coach, Castamado. And uh, Mike Tyson has been very open talking about that relationship uh, in part in this uh, one-man Broadway show. Have, have you seen it, Julian? No, I haven't. You should. It's, it's terrific. It's hilarious. It's, it's amazing. It, it can make you cry. It's, it's really great. He, he ran with it for a very long time. So I, I first would recommend listeners to uh, watch that thing if you can. The, the one person uh, Broadway show by Mike Tyson, he ran with it a few years ago. But uh, essentially, Mike Tyson is Mike Tyson as a person and as a boxer and as a champion because of the relationship that he had with Castamano, which is if you, if you follow Mike Tyson for a long time and you hear him talk about it and you know a lot about him, you would see is very, very much that master and disciple sort of relationship. It was even at, at that place where, you know, Castamano was uh, already quite old when he was coaching Mike Tyson. For the most part, he couldn't, do a lot of the physical stuff with Mike himself. He had his assistants who were also trained by him, teaching Mike, and he was standing there and he was adjusting everyone and touching their bodies and everything. But he couldn't pass on most of the boxing to Mike Tyson physically. But rather, there was obviously an, an inborn essence and a passion, a fire inside of Mike Tyson that was already there. But Mike Tyson himself, he says, he says it, you know, he, he would have never gotten close to what he achieved in his life and in his boxing career without this man, Castamado. And that transmission was a heart-to-heart -heart transmission that was interpersonal. It was familial from word family, and it was energetic. It was energetic at a level that 
you know, I, I was listening to Mike Tyson recently talking about how um, Castamada was a trained hypnotist and he b basically hypnotized him. He, he literally energetically changed his being physically and, and mentally and spiritually. So, I mean, you can say, ah, you know, I don't believe this Chinese nonsense, but here, here we go. You have it in Western boxing. It's everywhere. It's just not that, it's not always that people speak that sort of language, but it's there. It's been there from, you know, the dawn of um, human cultures and civilizations. Since we became cultured, civilized creatures, we have had such things, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I am and will always remain eternally grateful from all the great people that I've learned from over the years. Um, I think that, um, you know, learning at that very deep level is very much a heart to heart familial <coughs> transmission uh, from teacher to student. Um, and it is, like you said, in many ways, some people kind of say woo woo that's okay um each each person on their own path each person with their own perception their understanding and awareness and it's fine i i just don't listen to it anymore uh, you know I've, I, I i've stopped getting involved in this is that and that's that and it's like okay it's all good you're on your path you're where you want to be where you need to be um mm -hmm. train hard work hard be happy I think that's a very Chinese point of view, right? The Chinese are more accepting of circumstances because they see, you know, everybody is where they need to be. Yeah, and people are where they need to be in their journey. Um, and hopefully that all people can grow and develop above and beyond. I mean, I, I aspire to the best in people. Um, I try to see the best in people and I try to see the best in myself. Um, and aspire to to achieve the best in myself i'm not perfect far from it make mistakes um and but we always we should always try and learn and develop and grow it, it's it's our responsibility as a human being to do that um and that's why i keep going back that it's our responsibility within our chosen field of expertise in a chinese martial art or any martial art it's our responsibility to achieve the very best we can. We must always pursue excellence in what we're doing. So we, thus far, uh, we talked a lot about the theory and, and history and philosophy behind your uh, life and your journey and your system. And I want to get a little bit more technical uh, before we wrap up and, and, and just ask a few more questions. Um, Eagle Claw is a style famous for seizing and grabbing china in chinese yeah. and a lot of people nowadays are critical of these types of skills china seizing and grabbing because they feel that uh stand up joint locks meaning joint locks applied when people are standing as opposed to uh, wrestling on the ground is a skill that is difficult to apply or um they see that it's not very successfully applied usually in a sports-like setting, say in uh, MMA and modern MMA fights. And I was wondering if you could share with us how such skills are used in Eagle Claw, broadly speaking, and what are the uh, methods for successfully applying them while standing up as opposed to ground grappling, which people often see on TV. Well, if you play a game of strength, um, people try and muscle uh, joint locks or they're just not applied with the right idea in mind. You know, a joint lock, you lock the joint, but what do you do with it afterwards? So maybe the word lock is, is not a good word that we use in English. <clears throat> well, you know, qin na, qin na. What does it mean? Na is, yeah, I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you answer that. Thank you. Yeah, so in, in, uh, in Chinese, I think uh, it's often translated as, as seizing and grabbing. And when you seize or grab something, 
you you don't just stand there and hold on to it you know it's it's part of a continuous thing that goes on as opposed to locking okay i lock the cell door and I, and i go that's it i just locked it yeah so it's it's an instantaneous moment on and go somewhere else yeah so if you if you're trying to do a takedown on somebody you 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 use that moment of pain to open the door to something else that something else might be a break it might be a sweep it might be a throw um but china the way we see it set up as very uh programmed compliant movements china should be violent in its expression within the moment you know china mm. means to control well to control you you're not going to be nice and and you know just gently do something and if we if we go back to um earlier part of the conversation where people were much more involved in physical um uh, work they were much stronger there was a lot more physical work so their ability to apply things through the the the, the way their body worked they could apply much more power in a very uh, short space of time instant it, it's trained to be instantaneously on mm -hmm. eagle claw you you catch you seize it you also seize the moment and what you do in the moment so that that would be akin to where an eagle would grab the prey as the swoop on it from above right yeah hmm. and and we we see that actually but when they when they keep this image in mind it is a much better sort of image to have in mind as opposed to the word locking uh yeah just looking at an eagle on the nature channel trying to seize grab that rabbit it's not trying to lock it nope no no and what's it going to do once it's seized and grabbed it <laughs> the next action is to kill it mm -hmm. when an eagle catches its prey it wants to eat it so it's it's not going to play with it um, and just try and hold it down those talons they go right through the flesh they go from one side to another so they go right through and they'll tear chunks off they'll rip it with their beak they'll use other things so um i think eagle claw if you go back to the yusha sancho it was designed for soldiers in the battlefield the soldiers haven't got time to play around so the 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 the, the application must be instantly decisive mm -hmm. so you know china is instantly in the moment sees the moment so actually if if we compare this to uh the way joint locking is often done on the ground it's true that in terms of technique if we compare the technique these are often the exact same technique in terms of the external appearance but in terms of the imagery and the intention and the way the muscles would be applied to the technique it wouldn't be the same no you have to you have to you have to adapt to any situation uh, necessary but if you if you look at the the MMA guys who are very very good at, at setting up ground locks and submissions hmm. it's a game it's a conversation between the two it's whoever has got the better vocabulary in the moment gets the lock into a point where it's going to break if they apply any more pressure all those locks are going to break if they apply any more pressure the person taps out before their arm breaks so you know it's a setup it's it's a doorway to something else people call it submission because the guy gives up before he gets his bones broken quite rightly too you know but if if you take that that same submission onto the street and somebody's got a knife are you going to let go when they tap out if they're still holding a knife i don't think so I, I, you know you wouldn't stay in a lock you 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 need to adapt to the moment and you so i'm i'm just going to repeat the the concept the idea seize the moment what you do with it it's up to you mm -hmm. so 
I mean, it's it's a bit difficult, uh, even if we included the video uh, and it's going to be an audio-only interview, uh, to give a kinesthetic sense of how the system works. But if if we may still try, because you're talking about the setup, the setup aspect of the joint locks while uh, in stand-up fighting. Could you try to describe a few examples for such setups uh, to precede joint locks in this manner? Well, Chinna is only one aspect of Eagle Claw. And if it's, uh, if it's perceived as the only aspect of Eagle Claw, then it does the system a disservice because it's only one small part. So you've got Ti Da Na Shua, Ti Kick, Da, Strike. Na, lock or control, swipe, mm -hmm. throw. Then you've got <clears throat> three ranges, wrist, elbow, shoulder and neck. So you can throw at different points along the body to have different outcomes. You, you can do neck and spine controlling movements, which are very devastating. You can do an elbow or shoulder, which is less devastating. So again, it's the escalation and what you do with it in the moment um, to, to uh, ensure the outcome is in your favor. But um, if you're too busy trying to put on locks, what about all the striking that's in Eagle Claw or the point striking or the, the, the seizing and tearing, the, the splitting, the breaks and things like that. So uh, I think Eagle Claw should be viewed with a much more rounded view, encompassing a lot more skills than just joint locking. So basically you're saying uh, it, it's taken out of context if we just think that the Eagle Claw practitioner is seeing an opponent and he's like, oh, I'm going to grab him. It's just one part of the arsenal being used when it's appropriate. That's right. And you and I both know you can't grab a punch that's when it's thrown fast. Definitely not. <laughs> yeah, so this idea of catching a punch out of thin air, not gonna happen, mm -hmm. not gonna happen. So how do you get into that position of being able to catch an arm? Is it the punch, which is the fastest moving part? Or is it the elbow, which is moving slower? Is it the, the touch and the setup into something else? that enables you to control the opponent. It's all of these things. You know, are you, are, you, are you kicking low, fainting high, attacking low? Are you fainting low, attacking high? You know, they, they, they talk about ying zhao fan zi chuan. Fan means to rotate, yeah? Like ba fan shou, one of the early parts of Eagle Claw that Liu Shijian knew eight flashing or rotating palms so they flash they flash out you, you 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 put something there then you touch you listen you counter mm. so that the, the hands flash and rotate so people think about acrobatics in eagle claw it's not acrobatics it's rotating and people have said it's tumbling well a stone tumbles when you roll downhill but it's not doing cartwheels and backflips is just rotating and tumbling. So basically, so I think uh, Shifu Julian is trying to say that uh, with, with the more bodily expressive aspects of the art that, that other people see as some types of uh, acrobatics, it's actually teaching the body to react better to the opponent by being able at, at, the, mom at the moment's notice, if the need calls for it, to, to twist the body in a certain way that um, would either help one get away from danger or that the opponent would not anticipate. Yeah, and you've also got to know that uh, Eagle Claw has developed a, a large frame, big northern aspect, which is a more modern feature to Eagle Claw. There are benefits in so much as that it teaches the body to expand, which enables you to contract later on. But the, the old root Eagle Claw, no kicking above the waist. Mm -hmm. no so like in the... Uh, like in Okinawan Karate, in Okinawan Karate also before, uh, maybe in the 1950s, they would not usually kick above the waist. Well, yeah, you know, <laughs> if you put your leg in the air, you're asking to get your, your pearls. The dragon steals the pearls, aren't you? And plus your balance is so compromised. 
Uh, it, it takes so much time. I mean, there are some, it's not to discredit people who can who can kick and there's some amazing, amazing, incredible martial arts people who have, you know, incredible kicking skills, but old Eagle Claw doesn't kick above the waist. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, I, I mentioned personally uh, in the very beginning of the interview, that we're going to say something about the relationship between Eagle Claw and Ba Gua Zhang. Ba Gua Zhang being a very popular uh, style from Northern China, one of the uh, so-called Chinese internal arts. Um, a style that ha it has its own uh, wonderful traditions. And Ba Gua Zhang has many lineages. And recently I was speaking with Julian and he mentioned something very interesting about the relationship between Eagle Claw and one of these lineages of Ba Gua Zhang. So uh, Julian, would you like to share with us uh, that information you told me about? Sure, there's... there's uh... The 64 linear palms of Bagua, um, my understanding is the teacher, co-creator, inventor, and I... I Wait, just, just a moment. So, so because um, Julian was mentioning the 64 linear palms of Bagua, uh, the, there is actually more than one tradition of Bagua Zhang that has 64 linear palms, right? Because we, we also have the... Yeah, I was going to say, I, my Bagua knowledge is limited, so I can only share what little bits of information I have on this. Mm -hmm. Insofar as uh, Liu De Quan was a student of Liu Shijun in Beijing. Now, Liu Shijun was the Eagle Claw, um, modern day founder. Liu De Quan also studied Bagua in the Dong Hai Chuan lineage family. Liu De Quan, from what I understand, and again, I'm sure there are more learned people than I that can correct the details, created or systemized some much faster combative training methods that were uh, based on the Eagle Claw, the Yu Shu San Shou, Ba Fan Shou, uh, Ying Zhao Fan Zhuan that Liu Shijun had been consolidating. So the circle walking, twisting, and a lot of the turning in Bagua, Liu De Quan created, again, caveat for more learned people than I to correct me, the linear straight line, 64 palms, using the, 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 the palming method from Bagua on the principle of the Ying Zhao Fan Zetuan, Ba Fan Shou, Yu Shu San Shou, linear training patterns. Okay, so I'm just putting it in, in context and in slightly different words for uh, those listeners who are less familiar with what we're talking about. So Bagua Zhang is a martial art noted uh, with its practice methods with practitioners walking in circles and practicing a lot of the methods while walking in circles. And it does not have a lot of methods in which you practice the art in walking on straight lines as is more common in most other traditional Chinese martial arts. Uh, typically in traditional Chinese martial arts, the forms are uh, made out of what is called um, roads. Okay, the word Taolu. Taolu in uh, Mandarin Chinese is basically a set of roads. And then a road would be you walk in one direction, so you start the form, you start doing a set of movements to the right, you change direction, you do a set of movements to the left. When you go to the right, that's the first road. You go to the left, then that's the second road. You go again to the right, that's the third road. Etc. Etc. Taolu set of roads in Bagua Zhang. Even their Taolu, a lot of the stuff is practiced in circles. Now we are speaking here of a certain very famous practitioners of Bagua Zhang called Liu De Quan, and Liu De Quan was uh, a teacher who one of several teachers who added uh, materials to his Bagua Zhang system, and one of uh, there was there was at least another uh, teacher. Uh, beside Ludia Kwan, who created something that is called 64 linear palms. Now, the idea is to create 64 um, techniques or combinations of techniques that you practice on uh, straight lines as opposed to walking in circles. And Julian here is uh, telling us that basically in that tradition, to, to the best of his knowledge, and perhaps there's slightly more accurate information out there, 
uh, Liu Dequan created those uh, 64 linear palms based on techniques, methods, and strategies and tactics that are common also with the eagle claw system that he has studied and is teaching, correct? Correct. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Okay. So now, before we wrap up, I'd like to, to, for you, if you may, to tell us a little bit about your school in the United Kingdom and how you bridge the gaps with, from, you know, this very traditional Chinese culture to students in modern times who come from, obviously, a very different type of culture. Well, over the past, um, let me think, I've had a full-time Wuguan or Mogwun in Cantonese, full-time Kung Fu school since uh, 1997. <clears throat> um, and, and been teaching both Tai Chi and Eagle Claw. Um, over the years, I've uh, moved once, uh, 18 years ago, to a top floor of a warehouse, it was only two stories, of 2,500 square feet. And it's a very traditional Kung Fu school. We have the ancestral tables uh, in respect to uh, my, my Eagle Claw family, uh, the Yufei ancestral table, um, or, or Guan Gong some, is also the patron saint of martial arts. We have all of the Lin Gong conditioning and strength uh, training equipment, lions, weapons, the, 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 the Dit Da Jiao, the, all the Chinese uh, herbs and medicines. Maybe if I can spin the camera around, you can see they're all there, Jonathan. Okay, so what, what I'm seeing here in video is just a very typical, uh, very traditional martial arts school, especially like you'd see in Hong Kong, with just piles and piles and piles of stuff on top of each other. There are countless books and magazines here, many pictures. Uh, there is uh, what seems to be an altar for the ancestors. We see uh, that there are clay vases, some of them very large, uh, likely containing uh, the Dieta Jio material, right? Correct, yeah. I can't really see because I'm holding the camera up the other way around, so hopefully my finger's not in the way as well. No, it's not. So, so there's a lot of uh, traditional aspects here. There, there is a little water fountain, there is a, there's a bonsai tree, um, a traditional flag, which is, is common since the 20th century, in, maybe even earlier in China, for traditional martial arts um, that the lineage would have its own flag with an emblem, in this case an emblem of an eagle, and uh, the clay, the large clay pots contain uh, the liquid of the Dia Da Jio, the, the hitful medicine or hitful wine, which is used for conditioning of uh, limbs. When you condition them, you just un not, ju not simply hit objects, but you also, before hitting and after hitting those objects, are going to put a little bit of that wine medicine uh, on the limb that you're going to condition so that it wouldn't get hurt and would, that would heal faster. And, and here uh, behind Julian um, is a wall with uh, several pictures, the biggest of which at the top is of the giant picture of an eagle, it's pretty large, an eagle swooping down, which is the main idea, of course. And, and uh, uh, we have pictures here of um, for Julian with his teachers, um, very respectable teacher. Yeah, this is uh, my Eagle Claw teacher, Chen Jun Shin, um, my Eagle Claw teacher and his wife. Over here is my Tai Chi teacher. So this is in his uh, home in uh, Hangzhou in China. And then there's just uh, other family photos and, and things like this. So my teachers are behind me um, always, and uh, I keep them close as we do and should do in traditional Chinese uh, Kung Fu um, culture. Yeah, I mean, th this is uh, it's actually, if, if we look at it from the perspective of Feng Shui, Feng Shui and literally wind and water is the tradition in very ancient tradition in China of how to relate the external environment to our uh, physical body and psychology and affect us psychologically, spiritually. People think that nowadays Feng Shui is about putting uh, a vase at the corner of the room. It's, it's much broader than that. I won't get into it, but essentially the feng shui of putting your teachers behind you, and Julian has been speaking with me, and these, the picture of his teachers are right behind him all the time. They are at his back, 
they, they're giving him some back, but they're also watching him, and <laughs> as, and he can feel it. Absolutely, absolutely. That's why when I'm at the Kung Fu school on my own, I'm never alone. Hmm. Because I have the ancestral table, I have Guan Guang, I'm never alone. So I'm quite happy to be here on my own because I'm never alone. And I, I just want to go back a little bit to, to something I tried to inquire about earlier when I asked, so, so how do you um, relate this very traditional culture to this, you know, modern day kids that got their PlayStation Xbox at home and suddenly you talk about Confucius, that's a bit confusing. So what's going on here? How do you uh, bridge that gap? Um, it's difficult in some ways because I'm very deeply within the Chinese culture of thinking and philosophy. So almost, and I think you, 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 you and I agree on this, it's almost as if we stand with a footstep, a foot in each world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> And we don't necessarily think completely like Western people because we've been so deeply embedded and immersed within Chinese culture for so many years. So, so that's a trap, right? Because you want to become a part of that family, but you become part of that family, it sort of takes you away a little bit from your origin culture. And also to, to link back the Confucian philosophy aspires to the very best ideals unless it's weaponized to what the Confucian ideology of manipulation control and power so I always try to look for the best uh, and, and seek the best message within the essence of what's being said um, is to be tolerant patient and not demand too much from Western students who are very much hobbyists mm -hmm. over time as they learn more they want to get in deeper and they want to understand more so then they ask deeper questions and this goes back to us learning about the conversation about the system and going between a style and a system of martial arts everybody starts the style because that's what attracts over time, they get into the system. They want to learn more. They want to understand what's all the Chinese medicine for? Why do we use it? What's the ancestral table for? Why do we use it? You know, what's its purpose? It's the, and then you start explaining more. And they say, oh, okay, okay, thanks. And that's fine. They take as much or as little as they want. And they go in as far to the system or not, as the case may be for them as an individual. Mm -hmm. So... I was, when I was younger, I was very, ah, must be this way. No, it's, it's just come, train, enjoy, work hard, live your life, be happy. Um, if you're not happy, move on, go somewhere else, but find your happiness. Um, we have a multi-faith, multicultural society. We should respect people's views, not impose and encroach into other people's thoughts, beliefs. We should openly discuss and debate um, uh, and uh, be objective in our thinking. So would I be correct to say that your strategy nowadays is to present them with what is possible, but never coerce them to go in that direction. Let them discover the path on, all, on their own as they go along. Yeah, and I think it's be patient as well and just observe. And maybe, maybe that's right. Observe. Wait and watch. Wait and watch. Those that gravitate to more depth open more and more. So there's no, nothing hidden, but we just sometimes wait to give more. Do you think that perhaps this is what's stopping a lot of traditionalist teachers from being able to pass on their traditions that they are trying too hard and are not observant enough. I can only speak for myself. Um, you I don't have to name names. You, <laughs> you can give examples without naming names. No, no, no. I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm, I'm not withholding. I'm, I'm saying that I think everybody has their own very individual approach to things. Mine personally is I, 
I have to teach honestly. I have to teach honestly because if I reflect back on, on where I am as the Baisha lineage, I have to stand every day, Kaltao, Baisan, pay respect to the ancestors. I have to stand in front of them with honesty. And if I'm, I'm not just doing... you, you can't see Julian what, what he was doing right now. He was going through some motions in front of the altar, and he's basically implying, you know, because of his traditional Baisha relationship, that he part of um, part of what he has to do every day is to to make an offering in front of the the altar to the ancestors of the eagle claw system. He's just right now taking me. Uh, with the computer, I think, to see the altar uh, so, so I can uh, look at it directly. Oh, so, okay. So we are seeing a, a very, very traditional uh, Chinese martial arts altar. And what it is, is you, um, in this case, uh, it's a little closet. Sometimes it would be a shelf. These are um, these two, two um, closet or box type things, all in red. Uh, with a, and on top of them, uh, so imagine uh, like uh, something that's the height of a four or five tier shoe cabinet, but it's just a box and it's red and it has a red background and there are two of them. One of them uh, at the red background has a shelf with Guang Gong uh, on the right, uh, Guang Gong or uh, Guan Yu, uh, the, the Chinese uh, god of war. Uh, but he's not, it's not praying to a god, it's a symbol in Chinese martial arts uh, to, to honor the arts and the, and the ancestors. And he is on one altar there, a the smaller altar. And the bigger altar ha is the lineage altar uh, for the uh, lineage, uh, specific lineage of uh, for Julian uh, in the Eagle Claw system. And there are pictures of the ancestors descending uh, from the uh, oldest ancestor that we have an extent picture of uh, down to uh, the most recently deceased ancestors uh, in the system. And it's uh, one picture above the other, the, the older ancestors at the top, the relatively younger ancestors at the bottom. And the uh, pictures are nicely decorated uh, with a red, small red background themselves. Below them are two uh, symbolic candles, some statues, an incense burner on which one would burn incense every day. There are uh, three plates uh, which are symbolically filled with oranges uh, as, a, as a gift uh, because one offers both the incense in, in the spiritual sense and one also offers food to the ancestors. And it's all a very uh, dignified presentation that is found in the school. Oh, Julian, I can't see these, these small objects. Would you, would you like to say what these are? These are uh, uh, cup offerings of, uh, <clears throat> we use wine, uh, like a beitu, uh, strong wine. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, guardian lions. I'm just trying to find them there, both sides with uh, money, gold. Which you know, gum is very important. Um, so basically, so the, the altar uh, is, is a miniature representation of this covenant that Trifu Julian has with the Kung Fu family. It has uh, guardian lions on both sides that are protecting uh, so called the family estate. Uh, there's the incense offering to the ancestors that it's a spiritual connection. And there is food and there is wine, it's fe feeding and and then providing drink for the ancestors. And, and there are two candles gi giving light onto them, et cetera, et cetera. And it's all very respectful. It's, it's a part of you know, traditional Chinese culture. It's something you don't uh, very often see nowadays in traditional Chinese martial arts schools, but it was uh, at one point in time very common and, and many schools still do that. And I respect it very much that Jillian has taken the, the effort to uh, to go through all of this, but it is to be expected, you know, with what he had described in three days, three whole days of uh, ceremonies to, to be accepted into the family. And this is all, by the way, uh, very Confucian, because this is the part of the Confucian notion 
of the importance of ceremony and ritual as a way to build stronger relationships between people who are alive and also uh, between the living and the deceased. And uh, Julian has taken me around the school. The school has uh, a lot of uh, lion dance costumes, which are worn when people uh, go, go about and do the traditional lion dances and festivities, Chinese New Year's to um, symbolically exercise the bed spirit and, and ghosts. There is um, a Wing Chun style, almost Wing Chun style wooden dummy and it's similar, slightly different design. And Jillian says, no, 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 Jillian, to describe us, what, what's different about this uh, Eagle Claw wooden dummy? Well, it, the, the two arms come out perpendicular, so they're side by side. Um, the Wing Chun dummy has a cross arm. Mm -hmm. This is also the fact that I'm just building in tradition with uh, uh, my, my Shu Fu's instructions. <clears throat> so we, we have slightly different uh, methods on the, the Mukyan Zong or Muyan Zong, as it's known. Um, we have respectful photos on this side to past teachers and practitioners of Eagle Claw. Um, so, you know, the, the, the school, as you can now see with our tour, <laughs> I'm sorry that your uh, listeners aren't able to see the, the school as well. Oh, they, they can many... go, we'll, we'll give you a website later and they can go on your website and there are wonderful uh, videos and pictures and they could see it there. Yeah, so these, these two gold tablets here, these are the um, announcement pieces from my teacher to uh, announce exactly who I am, what I am within the Zhu Ting Ying Zhao Fan Zhi Chuan Jia Ren family. Okay, so, so, so this is, I, I just want to, again, put this in perspective. Uh, so Julian has these very um, unique go gold tablets, almost like a, it's, a, it's a picture frame uh, with a, a gold, golden picture in it with the uh, golden eagle emblem, uh, which states in, in Chinese that he's a part of that lineage and a part of that system. And this was uh, gifted to him by, by a shifu. And this is very important because oftentimes what happens in, in traditional Chinese martial arts and, and lineages is that after some years, often after the, the head teacher passes away, uh, some people claim that they have been disciples and they're related to the system in this or that manner. Uh, and they make those false claims and that causes a lot of trouble for everyone. So it's always good in these traditional systems uh, that people have means of verifying that these these folks are part of the system, these, these folks aren't. Um, so that's what this, this is intended for. Yeah, so um, thanks for having a little tour of uh, the Wu Guan. Mm -hmm. Wu Guan in, in Mandarin Chinese means the martial hall. It's uh, the equivalent, not the same words, but equivalent to the word dojo in Japanese, dojo would be the place of the way. Yep, yep. So this is our our family home in uh, Europe, because I represent the family in Europe. All right. So uh, one more thing be, be, before we wrap this up, um, I seem to remember that in recent times your school was visited and honored by some famous people. Would you like to say something about that? Uh, yeah, uh, a few years ago, 2017, the uh, British Prime Minister at the time in residence, Theresa May, uh, visited our, our Kung Fu school. <clears throat> and it's one of the first times, as far as I, I am aware, that a British Prime Minister has ever visited a Chinese Kung Fu school. And we gave her a special uh, lion dance um, at the time and performance. So. Uh, yeah, our, our school is, was blessed with a very significant visit from a British Prime Minister. Every two years, um, now I think next year will be our fourth um, um, celebration of this, I host something called the UK Kung Fu Gathering. Uh, and I invite and bring all my friends who are Sifus and teachers from across England. And we all come together, uh, very much Hong Kong style. Um, 
and uh, you know, last year uh, I brought my Shufu and my Shruti, my younger brother, over from China. Um, there was about 25 visiting uh, uh, teachers with their students. There was something like 160 people crammed into my school. It oh was my. packed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's it's a medium school, but to cram 160 people there would be would be a lot. It was it was absolutely ram packed, um, and this is something that uh, uh, was born out of. I used to uh, a very good friend of mine in London, uh, Sifu Jim Uglo from the Chan Hun Jung Hong Ga family from Hong Kong, used to host these uh, kung fu parties at his uh, school in London which I was privileged to attend on many occasion. And uh, um, for the far past, since 2015, it's been my privilege to, to host them at my school now. So it's a way for the Kung Fu community to come together in friendship and harmony. And this is really important for traditional Chinese martial arts to survive. We need to stay on good friendship and good terms with each other, break down the barriers between the this style and that style, the north and south, is work together. The, the, the harmony of, of, of friendship is, is something that is very important. Mm -hmm. That's a very good message. And so uh, if people wish to, to get a hold of you, how should they do that? Uh, my website is www.eagleclawkungfu.uk. So you can find my website there, uh, eagleclawkungfu.uk. Okay, I'm definitely going to put that link in the uh, video notes on my YouTube channel. <coughs> Sorry, uh, um, what is your school's address in the UK? We're based in Maidenhead in Berkshire. Um, the address is on the website. So we are about 50 minutes drive from the centre of London, slightly. So we're, we're considered to be in the southeast of England. Um, so 20 minutes or, or 15 minute drive from center of London? Uh, five zero, say five one, zero. Hour, one hour, but we're very close 15 minutes drive to Windsor Castle. So that's a, a big place that people might mm -hmm. more readily know, Windsor Castle. Okay, okay, that's very good. And uh, any additional message that you'd like to deliver to the martial arts community? Um, I'm, uh, there's not really my place to, to, to make any such um, big statements. I think um, is uh, just work hard, enjoy your life, be happy, be humble. Um, and uh, yeah, just, just, just do your best. Just do your best. All right, Trifle Julian. Do. Thank you so much. I think this is one of the best martial arts conversations that I've personally ever had. I'm sure the listeners have enjoyed it as well. Thank you very, very much for being on the show today. Thanks so much for your invitation. It's a real privilege, Jonathan, from such an esteemed uh, author and practitioner such as yourself. Um, it's been my privilege to sit here and uh, talk with you for the past couple of hours. I hope your, your listeners don't get too bored and um, maybe there's some things of interest and uh, um, yeah, thanks so much for having me on. It's been a, an, an absolute pleasure to talk, talk with you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thanks a lot. That's it, folks. This was our first interview on Jadecast. Wasn't it great? Julian is such a knowledgeable guy and yet he's so modest. I very much appreciate him as a human being and as a martial arts teacher and he's doing a great job carrying on his cherished traditions and honoring his teachers. You could really hear in his voice and in the manner in which he speaks how much he cares for what he's doing in his everyday life and for his system and its ancestors. It's just incredible that we live in a time that is so technologically advanced and still we have great people like Julian carrying forth such traditions. Hey, tell you what, if you are interested in traditional martial arts, and especially the Chinese martial arts, I have written a few books about these things. So you might want to 
hop over to your Amazon website, whether you live in the States, that's Amazon.com, or in Canada, that's, that's Amazon.ca, and all the other Amazon websites, they all carry my books. And you could search for Research of Martial Arts, Research of Martial Arts, or The Martial Arts Teacher, or otherwise just write my name, Jonathan Bluestein, in the search. And you'd get to see all those books of mine. There are hundreds and hundreds of positive reviews. And you might find an interest in these tomes that I've worked very hard to write and publish. Um, the book descriptions are on Amazon, as are the reviews. And you should also definitely check out Julian's website, uh, to which I've included the link below the video. Have a wonderful day wherever you are. Keep strong, keep healthy, keep motivated. And keep on the good work with the traditional martial arts or with any martial arts that you practice because we respect any system and style as long as people are virtuous and diligent. Have a good day and I'll see you next time on our second interview.